Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Strozinski, and I'm Senior Vice President for Advocacy and General Counsel here at the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association. On behalf of the entire team here at MHA, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Information Blocking, What Providers Need to Know. A few logistics before we start. If you have questions during the webinar, please enter them into the chat feature as we are in a listen-only mode. The questions will come directly to us, and we'll do our best to address as many as we can, um, both during or, or after the, the presentation. I also want to take a moment now to thank MHA's 2024 annual sponsors and strategic partners for their support in underwriting today's webinar, which is just one of many events we offer throughout the year to connect our members with leading experts on timely issues like the one today. I'm now pleased to introduce our speakers today from Verrill, Victoria Larson and Andrew Furrer. Victoria is a healthcare associate at the firm's Healthcare and Life Sciences Group, where she uses her clinical research and life science background to solve issues in healthcare settings. Victoria is committed to helping hospitals, physician groups, HMOs, and healthcare providers with a range of matters, such as licensure privacy issues, as well as healthcare fraud and abuse compliance. Andrew is a partner at Verrill and brings over 15 years of experience in complex legal issues regarding healthcare. He holds legal experience in several areas, including regulatory compliance, patient rights, healthcare licensing, drug control registration, and more. Andrew's clients are wide ranging, encompassing large hospital networks, urgent care providers, hospices, healthcare agencies, trade associations, and more. Over the course of his career, Andrew is committed uh, to fostering an innovative and inclusive healthcare sector. Thank you both so much for being here today for this important discussion. Um, and I'll hand it over to both of you to get us started. Thank you, Mike, and um, good afternoon, everyone. We just want to say thanks to all for for joining us today, and a special thanks to the MHA for for hosting. I'm Andrew Ferrer. I'm a partner here at Verrill. I'm joined by Victoria Larson, uh, and we're very happy to be here and offer information and guidance on the information blocking rule, specifically as it applies to healthcare providers. Uh, we've prepared a number of helpful slides, some of which we'll we'll just touch on in the interest of time, but they will be available uh, following the presentation. So I'm going to go ahead, go ahead and share my screen here and get the presentation going. Um, and to the folks at MHA, if, if, if you have trouble seeing the slides cycling, cycling, please just let me know. Um, so information blocking, what providers need to know. So just to start with a brief history lesson, uh, I think we're all familiar with, with electronic records and the need to comply with HIPAA. Uh, to protect pa patient privacy and data security. But it's important to remember that this is not where the exchange of uh, healthcare records begins and ends. This is a decades old law meant to address decades old issues when, el when electronic records were still a new concept. Uh, it, it's highly it remains highly relevant and it's a staple of healthcare regulatory compliance, but it remains a product of its time. In the 21st century, we have a lot of, we have we have a wider range of problems uh, that relate to healthcare records and, and protecting them and, and sharing them. Electronic communication is now integral in, in all aspects of our modern way of life. Um, and so it's now expected in, in order to participate in the, mar in the marketplace. Everything is now digitized. Uh, patients and providers must rely on electronic communications to facilitate a efficient exchange of information and to ensure patient access and continu continuity of care. In, for, in, in effect, information is power. Data, data is, is, is supreme across the entire industry. Uh, there's heavy reliance on, on the use of electronic records uh, and Andrew, any disruption to that impacts. Sorry, um, Andrew, you're, uh, you're on the wrong screen with the, uh, the presenter view. We can see the next slide Sorry. on there. That's right. Can you can you see the the next slide? Uh, yes, it's the next slide presenter view. Um, so up here you're gonna want to switch my screen again somehow. Maybe. Sorry about that. So you edit. I apologize. Can everyone see that? There we go. Looks good. Thanks. I'm gonna move. Can, can you see that moving? Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you. So I apologize no. to the group for that. Um, just just to re just to restate, today everything is 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 electronic, uh, and 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 it, it disruptions to the to the to the exchange of, of of electronic information 
uh, can really have a huge impact on, on the ability of patients and providers and insurance companies and other market participants. So those who block the, the electronic health information from being shared efficiently can have significant power uh, and, and truly adverse effects for patients and for the healthcare sector broadly. So what is the information blocking rule? It's, it's part of the 21st Century Cures Act uh, enacted in 2016 uh, and makes sharing of, of EHI by providers and health IT profession, professionals the expected norm in healthcare. Uh, in, in effect, creates a new standard to protect freedom of patient access and a more efficient exchange of EHI across the healthcare sector. Uh, the rule prohibits practices that intentionally and unjustifiably hinder the exchange, access, or use of EHI. And so to whom does the rule apply? Uh, it, it applies to primarily three category, three main categories of, of market participants. Healthcare providers, which is broadly uh, defined, it, it pretty much includes anyone in the industry, healthcare entities, physicians, individual clinicians, uh, healthcare IT developers of certified health information technology, also health information networks and health information exchanges. And again, our, our presentation is focusing on just healthcare providers. EHI. So what, what is EHI? This, the, the rule covers specifically something called EHI, and it can be thought of as being very similar to what we're all familiar with under HIPAA being PHI. Uh, but, 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 but EHI refers more to electronic PHI that is captured in a healthcare provider's designated record set. And this will exclude psychotherapy notes um, and any information that's compiled uh, for the use in any form of litigation, administrative action, or other proceeding. So it's still a wide range of, of information, but it, it is, it is a, still a subset of PHI. We included this slide here for everyone to see. It comes from the healthit.gov website that helps give a visual, visual representation of the difference between PHI, EPHI, and then EHI that's covered by the information blocking rule. So, so the main question, what is information blocking? It's essentially a practice which is really defined as any act or omission that's likely to interfere with the access exchange or use of electronic health information. And this can take a variety of forms. We've included just a couple, couple here. I mean, certainly any deliberate refusal, refusals to exchange data, any excessive fees that are charged to connect to EHR systems, and, and often most commonly will be technical barriers that prevent what's called interoperability. Uh, really, this can be a non-standard implementation of an electronic health record system at a provider or between providers, uh, or anytime a health IT switching from an EHR to another EHR is made technically difficult, difficult due to any type of, of uh, incompatibilities with, with different platforms. And essentially, the problems that information blocking can cause really are myriad ones, um, but most chiefly, it can impede access to care if information can't be exchanged across different healthcare systems or different EHR, EHRs. Uh, it can disrupt, disrupt continuity of care, very similar. Um, limit, ultimately, it can limit patient freedom when they choose providers or limit providers in, in choosing EH, EHR platforms. Uh, when share uh, for the purpose of trying to to move to a more to a, to a more technologically advanced platform or maybe a more cost effective one, um, and the, the ultimate results of of information blocking can be much higher costs throughout the healthcare sector due to more to a more chaotic way of having to share records. So, compliance with the healthcare with the information blocking rule will certainly be paramount, and it began in in, in September of last year. Uh, healthcare providers will be held to a reasonableness standard, uh, but it, essentially it applies to it, whenever a healthcare provider engages in a practice that a provider knows is unreasonable and is, and is likely to interfere with the access exchange or use of EHI. This is ultimately going to be a judgment call throughout the industry you know, in, in every particular case, um, but the standard that applies to a healthcare provider is higher than, than, than that which is applied to health IT professionals. Um, and it's important to remember that liability can be found unless the particular practice, that is an act or omission resulting in information blocking, uh, liability will be found if, if it's not covered uh, by an exception or otherwise it's required by law. 
So there are eight exceptions. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them uh, on on this presentation, but we've included them for you, just with a, with a, some with a little bit of a summary. Um, there are some that that involve uh, uh, not fulfilling requests to access Exchange or UZHI. Uh, most commonly will be used, will, will likely be preventing harm uh, or preventing, uh, ensuring privacy and, and ensuring security. Perhaps there will be some type, some occasions where, where sharing will be infeasible and therefore it'll be permissible, a form of permissible information blocking. Uh, there are the other exceptions deal more with, with procedural aspects of fulfilling requests and, and maintaining data, content and matter, matters involving char the charging of fees, as long as they're, they're reasonable, um, and any licensing issues that relate to, to uh, EHRs. Uh, these exceptions very function almost like safe harbors that we're familiar with in other compliance areas. They provide certainty that when you when you fall under an exception, you when you comply with with all the tenants of a various one of the various exceptions, it will not be whatever practice you're engaged in will not be considered information blocking. Um, but conversely, a practice that does not meet an, an exception, it will not automatically be considered information blocking, but it will be evaluated on a case by case basis. Um, and Victoria. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, so who's going to enforce the information blocking rule? We have HHS, and within HHS, we have both ONC and OIG. ONC, they're responsible for really leading HHS's health IT efforts. Um, so they've developed standards that should be used across the board for EHI exchange. Um, they'll also have ability to um, enforce any practices that they believe goes against their certification that they give certain certified health IT programs. And then um, enforcement, what, what are they going to do if you are found to have committed information blocking? So for our developers and entities who are certified health IT, HINs, HIEs, you have civil monetary penalties of up to $1 million per violation if OIG finds that you have committed information blocking. This enforcement began in September of 2023. Now for our healthcare providers in October of 2023, they just released um, a proposed rule for disincentives that's currently being considered. Right now, these disincentives are only with respect to CMS programs. So as Andrew laid out within the healthcare provider actor, there's several individuals and groups that fall under that definition. But right now for disincentives, it's only CMS programs that have a disincentive attached to violating information blocking. So OIG and the rule, they proposed four different um, areas that they're expecting to really focus on as they begin to investigate allegations of providers committing information blocking. We've laid them out for you here. Um, these is, this is just where OIG is going to focus that beginning resources on. They believe these four um, practices could cause the most harm to both like patients, the healthcare system in general, et cetera. So OIG, when they begin investigating, they have a process that they've laid out. So if they receive an allegation of information blocking, they're going to start coordinating with that appropriate agency. Right now, that's CMS. Once they have determined that information blocking has occurred, they're going to refer that provider over to CMS and include various information such as the dates, um, why they believe any of the evidence demonstrates information blocking, etc. And then after OIG passes it off to CMS, CMS is going to send notice to the um, healthcare provider who was found to have committed information blocking. Um, the notice will include, again, description of the practice, effect of the disincentive, um, and any other information necessary. So right now, there's three proposed disincentives. Um, the Medicare Promoted Interoperability Program, the Quality Payment Program, and the Medicare Shared Savings Program. So this first one is going to affect eligible hospitals and critical access hospitals. So right now, the disincentive is if an eligible hospital or a critical access hospital was found to have committed information blocking, they would then not be a meaningful EHR user in an applicable EHR reporting period. They're expecting the impact to be a loss of about 75% of the annual market basket increase 
And for critical access hospitals, um, payment would be reduced to 100% instead of the 101%. Our second disincentive, this is gonna affect our clinicians and groups with respect to promoting operability. Um, here, the disincentive is again, these actors would not be a meaningful user of certified EHR um, and would therefore receive a zero score in the promoting operability uh, performance category. Um, and this would like affect um, about a quarter of your total score in a year. And then our last disincentive, this is gonna affect our ACOs, ACO participants. Um, so if an ACO was found to have committed information blocking, they would be deemed ineligible to participate in a Medicare shared savings program for a period of at least one year. Um, CMS has the ability to extend it beyond a year if they receive subsequent um, allegations of information blocking. Um, and this can result in a healthcare provider being terminated from an ACO um, or not receiving the revenue that they might have otherwise earned um, had they participated in the savings program. And then finally, the proposed rule includes um, transparency provisions. So, and this is for all actors, not just our healthcare providers. Um, ONC's website currently um, has some information that shows um, any allegations of information blocking, but right now they're proposing to also include um, if OIG identifies information blocking practices have occurred, who those actors are, what settlements um, were agreed upon, or any CMPs and disincentives administered. Um, we provided some information on the types of info that OIG is going to post on the website for your review. So what can providers do to start uh, start down the, down the road of complying with the information blocking rule? And, and uh, really, it's first things first. Uh, the most important is really making sure that decision makers at, at on, on the provider end side of the world um, have an understanding of the rule, not just that the rule is there, but that that what the specific obligations will be under the information blocking rule, at a minimum as broad concepts, uh, to then start down um, what we like to think of as really being a multi-focused due diligence program, uh, focusing on the technology aspect of healthcare um, of a healthcare provider's business, uh, also an organizational focus and a regional focus. And at the technology level, there really should be an ongoing evaluation of, of your health IT systems to identify potential uh, info blocking practices by your organization or even by third party IT vendors, um, prioritizing seamless data sharing and inter interoperability um, will be critical in, um, in developing a um, a technology flow and 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 program for for your business um, that that brings inf information blocking to the forefront of of um, your the, the deployment of your EHR and your policies for uh, releasing information, which then leads, of course, to the or to more of an organizational focus. There should be an ongoing review of in internal policies and procedures to prevent and identify. Non, areas of non-compliance. Uh, currently, a lot of a lot of providers train their staff on on matters such as HIPAA. Uh, this will dovetail well. Um, uh, uh, the info blocking rule training we would recommend should dovetail well with with uh, with HIPAA training on these new regulations. Um, and there should also be a, a move to modify relevant relevant policy documents within your organization, specifically as it relates to HIPAA and other uh, data privacy concerns. And then also looking at, at this more from a, a from a broader, more regional focus, um, you know, we think we think it's valuable for for healthcare providers, you know, it, all all of whom you know know each other in the in the industry, to be communicating with each other about the types of of EHRs that they're using and 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 you know what they like about them and and um, you know you know how they work to make sure that that there's there is interoperability between uh, different systems and different providers to in order to promote data exchange and avoid obstacles later that could be construed as information blocking that isn't covered by a relevant exception. Um, and just to, re just to restate again, staff training will be important. Um, educating uh, the boots on the ground for uh, knowing what their responsibilities are, 
um, will will definitely go a long way to keeping people aware of of what needs to happen when um, now trying to balance HIPAA obligations uh, versus info blocking obligations. And then going along with your staff training, your compliance plan, definitely take a look at um, the planner policy to make sure information blocking is integrated into your existing operations. Um, so this can include updating your BAAs to make sure that data exchange is not unreasonably restrictive, um, as well as updating your notice of privacy practices just to clarify any uses and disclosures. And then your responsiveness to information requests. You're going to want to continually improve the speed of how you're responding um, to EHI and records requests. And as you're evaluating it, if any roadblocks come up, um, to fix those and to make sure it's running as efficient as possible. So for example, if a patient, um, if you require a patient to use a specific patient authorization form, just making sure that patient has access to it, knows where to find it, or that you provide it to the patient. And then finally, your record keeping is going to be very important. So in instances where you're going to have access or exchange of EHI that's not permitted, you're going to want to document um, why you can't share the EHI, the facts and circumstances around it, um, so that you can prove that you fall into one of the eight exceptions that Andrew laid out. Well, we hope this this overview of the information blocking rule has been has been helpful. Um, like I said, we included a lot of information in our slides, and we just wanted to make sure we could move through them as quickly as possible and get to questions. I'm sure, the group has a number of questions, um, but we know that these these slides will be distributed, and we're certainly happy to take questions now and and in the future. Great, Th uh, thank you uh, both, and, and and we do have some questions here that have come in uh, into the chat. I encourage others watching. Uh, we've got uh, several minutes left here in the presentation. If you do have questions, please put them in the chat function. I'll start with the first one here, and it's: uh, Is a healthcare provider required to push all records in its EHR to a patient portal? So, so at, at this point in time, there is well, if if the question about about pushing them in into the portal, um, it, it, at this point there there is a move from from paper records into electronic records. It, it's not that you're necessarily at this point required to make all of your records electronic. It's that the records you have, which are which do qualify at, under the definition of EHI under the rule, those must be uh, accessible um, through uh, through you know any, any formal electronic means to to uh, that it, that it at the same time complies with data and privacy rules. You have to be able to share that information effectively with whoever is actually whoever is asking, especially patients. Um, second question here is, uh, do you need to allow providers not on your staff open access to your EMR? I don't think we've seen a, re a requirement in the information blocking rule for that itself. Um, that's that's going to be a compliance question that relates to uh, who needs to know under under privacy rules such as HIPAA. Um, but but certainly anyone that does have access to to the records and is in a position of responsibility and authority for releasing records will need to make sure that they're following a policy and a protocol that that isn't overly restrictive. Um, and that that's the challenge. It, it's balancing it's balancing obligations, current obligations under state and federal privacy rules versus uh, this now push to ensure that there's data, efficient data exchange. So what you'll want to do is, is make sure you don't have overly restrictive policies. And it's really the, the people who are who are in charge of the release of, and exchange of records that will be, um, will, who will need act, who will of course need, you know, full access, but also will have, you know, a level of, a level of responsibility for making sure that information blocking doesn't occur. Thanks. Um... Next up, uh, as a hybrid covered entity, would a, I'm thinking, occupational health program not covered by HIPAA and that maintains a separate electronics record be subject to 21CC? Hard to entangle some aspects of OCH Health and the covered entity EMR. Well, the regulation is broad in defining what a healthcare provider is. 
Um, it, there, there isn't much guidance at this point as to as, as to you know any. There's no really real interpretive guidance beyond um, the the particular statute that that it, that the regulation pulls in that that adopts the the definition of of healthcare provider. Uh, from our reading, it, it's it's quite ex extensive. It doesn't appear to 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 hinge on 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 HIPAA. Uh, you know, we obviously it's it's, it's an issue that that you know we we were, are continuing to take you know a very close look at. But I think I think the starting premise for 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 people in, in the on the provider side of the rule is that if you provide healthcare services um, of of any sort, then information blocking you know should be at the top of your list for 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 a compliance plan. So then the final one here in the chat relates to an issue a, a, a lot of providers have been dealing with here over the last several weeks, and it's thoughts on the impact of the change healthcare cyber attack and the inability to produce records to patients and requesting entities. So, so yeah, I mean that. So, so obviously, I mean, a lot of these issues uh, are are born out of the electronic age that we're in, and, and, and that's and that's really why we want to just give a little bit of the flavor of that background. I mean, everything being digitized does create these risks, these cyber, these cyber crime risks. The the exceptions that that are provided, um, there 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 may be ways for providers to fall fall underneath them for purposes of preventing harm. Uh, or for to ensure security and patient privacy, and there's also a, an exception that relates to um, ma the main the maintenance of the of the EHR system. Um, it, it's going to be very very fact driven. It's it, there's not going to be you know really a one size fits all scenario. Uh, certainly, uh, it, it would I I would imagine that that when if we're talking about a situation where a provider is battling a, a cybersecurity incident. Um, that may change the analysis for for the OIG should should there be any restriction, temporary restrictions on data. But uh, that will remain to be seen. But but again, it's going to be a very fact driven circumstance. Thanks. I got uh, one more here. You had mentioned um, vendors um, in your presentation. What's the best way for a provider to determine if one of its vendors is complying with the new rule? That's a great question, and and it, it, it's it's one that we're actually thinking about a lot and. You know, I, I think a lot of a lot of the the ways to deal with this will be to examining uh, HIPAA business associate agreements, for instance. You know, updating those agreements to make sure that that vendors are you know make a statement. You know, uh, you know ha have an obligation to a covered entity to adhere to not just the rules, you know, the HIPAA rules or, or or other state laws, but but also expressly include the information blocking rule as a source of compliance, um, and and ensure ensure that they're that in turn, those business associates that use subcontractors that have subcontractor business associate agreements that, that include protective language for the covered entity. Because at the end of the day, it's the covered entity's data that's the subject of, of the information blocking. Um, in terms of vetting various, various um, uh, you know, potential IT vendors or EHR vendors, I mean, that's going to be, I mean, a lot of that's going to be very tech, you know, technology driven. You're going to want to make sure that, that um, you know, you're you're dealing with folks that, you know, have the latest technologies uh, that are involved. You know, say state of the art systems, um, and also understand what the, what their rules are for you know when they release data or they don't release data, and understand how their platform is compatible with other platforms. Right. Well, well, thank you. And I I, I see we've got a minute left here today, but a, a lot of great information and and uh, sort of a concise uh, package here. Um, I really want to thank uh, you both, Victoria and Andrew, for leading a great session today. Uh, if there are additional questions coming in, we'll make sure they get to you. And I'd encourage those of you watching, if you do have questions, to, to, to reach out separately to uh, Victoria and Andrew. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to get the QR code up on screen. If we do, you can scan it and see all of uh, MHA's uh, educational programming that's coming up. We've got a lot of great events this spring. We hope we'll see you again soon. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you very much.